Greetings. I am Norman Carrier Garamond Oxen Shipmunk III, and this is my intrepid pupil, Cory, a squirrel of the red tree variety. Waving to the people Norm claims are there. Norm, I can't see. And welcome to our series. Let's not dawdle and get on with it. Uh, this week we talk about something that matters. You may know what you are made of, skin, eyes, hair, etc., but all of those things are called matter. Every physical thing everywhere is made of what is called matter. Try chopping a block. If it were possible to chop that up into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, you'll reach units so tiny it cannot be cut. These units are called atoms. Atoms are so incredibly, unbelievably tiny, you cannot see them with only your naked eyes. Atoms are made of a center called the nucleus, which itself is made up of tiny subatomic particles called protons and neutrons. And the nucleus is surrounded by even smaller particles called electrons, like planets orbiting the sun. The behavior and number of all these three are bound by energy and move in really fast speeds. They all affect what kind of thing they create for all of us, depending on how many trons there are and how they move. Atoms bind with other nearby atoms to form what we see. So matter matters very much. Yes, everything matters. Those are matter. Those are matter. Those are matter. That, 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 that. I matter. You matter too. So much that you'll be wise to remember it. Matter. No, we're, we're done. Oh. If you like this episode and have opinions, suggestions, or feedback for future episodes of Tidbits with Norman Cory, do state them in the comments section. Science or nature-related topics are not a requirement. And don't forget to subscribe. Happy travels! Norm, I just sneezed. Got any plants around with wide leaves I can use to wipe? I say, Cory... Do you know why plants are so important? They make my nose not annoying? Just as you breathe in the oxygen that your body needs and breathe out the carbon dioxide that's bad for us, plants are the reverse. They take in the carbon dioxide from the air and breathe out the oxygen we need in a process called photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. Synthesis. Protosignorisis. Photo... Synthesis. Photosynthesis is a complex process that could admittedly get confusing to newcomers. For today, let's simplify. Plant cells contain pigment molecules known as chlorophyll that catch sunlight for energy, and as a side note, give the plant its green color. The plant uses this energy to break off carbon atoms from the carbon dioxide molecules and bond them to hydrogen atoms it takes from water molecules to make sugar for the plant so it can keep growing. And the oxygen is released back into the air. The more plants are around, the healthier everything around it becomes. And that is why all plants are so important. Ah, hey tree, here's some Carson Daily Oxide. If you like this episode and have opinions, suggestions, or feedback for future episodes of Tidbits with Norman Cory, do state them in the comment section. Science or nature-related topics are not a requirement. Interested in more detailed explanations for the intricate processes in photosynthesis? You may continue researching any of the above terms covered just now. And don't forget to subscribe. Happy travels! And now, here's something I hope you'll really like! Norm is letting me host this one so I can practice, and one day change the world by doing speeches to small critters unprovoked. This episode is about the squirrel! That's my favorite animal! <clears throat> the squirrel comes from the medium-sized rodent family, the same family that houses the chipmunk, woodchuck, prairie dog, oriental giant squirrel, Asian ornate squirrel, marmot, flying squirrel, and meerkat. Most of them are known for their distinctive tails, ranging from the wide, bushy, long, or barbecued, apparently, Invincible and handsome as we are, we can live in any place on Earth that has plants, so the poles and dry deserts are out. We have a heightened sense of vision, allowing us to travel through trees flawlessly and to defeat predators in hilarious fashion. <laughs> While I prefer nuts, we are herbivores, whose diet consists of fruit, buds, flowers, pine tree cones, fungi, leaves, and seeds. But some species can even eat animals, like insects, eggs, tiny birds, tiny snakes, and tiny rodents. Uh... We have 285 reported species housing the previously mentioned types and many more. There! How was that? Fine, but can you slow down next time? I've been swiping these cars like mad for 15 minutes. Oh, right. If you like this episode and have opinions, suggestions, or feedback for future episodes of Tidbits with Norm and Cory, state them in the comments section. Science or nature-related topics aren't a requirement. And don't forget to subscribe. See you later!
just roll it. Mostly associated with bears, hibernation is a state of decreased biological processes in response to lowering ambient temperature when nutrients or energy isn't as readily available as it was during the warmer seasons. If some animals do not hibernate, they won't survive the winter. Usually this includes storing or stuffing themselves on food in the fall, their body temperature lowers, heart rates slow down, and they don't really sleep so much as they lay dormant for days, weeks, or months. The way animals hibernate varies through species. For example, chipmunks need to wake up every few days when they're hungry, or need to take care of business, after which they promptly return back to sleep. Red squirrels do not hibernate, but just bide their time in the den. You did try to hibernate a year ago. No, that was last night. Wake up, feet! <gasps> Happy holidays, everyone. If you like this episode and have opinions, suggestions, or feedback for future episodes of Tidbits with Norman Corey, do state them in the comments section. Science or nature-related topics are not a requirement. And don't forget to subscribe. Happy travels! There! Now you're gonna sneeze! Try explaining that in your fancy, big-worded ways. Oh no! Whatever will- let's get this over with. Wah. Sneezing is an involuntary expulsion of air out of the body of an animal. As uncomfortable as it feels, it is very beneficial to your health, as it serves to get rid of foreign irritants that gather on the mucous membrane in your nose. Keeping your body clean is important, you know. You can't control when it happens, but it's frequently caused by a sudden drop in temperature, a flash of bright light, a full stomach, or infection. Your sneeze could lead to someone else getting sick, so muffle it carefully. Fortunately, I don't need to worry about all that. We're out of tissues. If you like this episode and have opinions, suggestions, or feedback for future episodes of Tidbits with Norman Corey, do state them in the comments section. Science or nature-related topics are not a requirement. And don't forget to subscribe. Happy travels! Ugh. Ah! Man in the moon! According to a book I read, the moon isn't really an evil ape rabbit hooligan who wants to cover your house with sand if you stay up too late. Actually, it's an illusion. The moon orbits the Earth, which both move in a larger orbit around the sun, counterclockwise. Where the moon is in relation to the sun results in the moon's shadow appearing to move across it from our perspective on Earth. To demonstrate. Whoa, 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 the shadow always moves around the moon from right to left over the course of approximately 29.53 days, after which the pattern repeats. A month lasts 30.44 on average. And, in fact, that is exactly where the idea of the month was born. The words moon and month originated from the same meaning. It's where humans first learned to keep track of the changing year. Whoa. Shh, he's asleep. If you like this episode and have opinions, suggestions, or feedback for future episodes of Tidbits with Norman Corey, do state them in the comments section. Science or nature-related topics are not a requirement. And don't forget to subscribe. Happy travels! Bees are more beneficial than you realize. What? They rarely want to sting a human, and only if they annoy them too much. Plus, some species kind of just die after doing it. And unless your entire life is focused only on honey, yeah. you'd ignore just how important a role they play in agriculture. For decades, bees have started dying out more often due to the usage of pesticides that help plants grow but are poisonous to the bees. Other factors include a parasitic mite that targets bees in particular, and the changing climate that screws up their flight pattern and causes colony collapse disorder. Some bees have even lost the ability to find their way back to the hive. <gasps> the worst that would happen to us would be the disappearance of one third of our most important fruits, vegetables, and wheat, as well as near to no plants that make pollen. Things you can do to help them. Make a garden from uncontaminated soil. Grow dandelions, a particularly rich source of pollen. Use natural chemicals that will not poison bees. Place bowls of water with stones in them for the bees to clean up. And do not run away from them like a crazy person. <laughs> Good.
good day, sir. Would you accept this book of sparrow hygiene from my best pal, Oh, no- by nature. I take a nap at this time. You should know that by now. Stop knocking up against my trunk. This is a more personal topic of mine. We are in an age where we literally have so much information at our fingertips with the press of one button, yet whenever I bring up something that an animal doesn't understand, I say, you should look it up, only to have him reply that I should provide it for him. And it's right in front of his face. Alright, while I relish in teaching everything I can to all kinds of networks found in the forest, I expect them to take some initiative too. That's why I let them borrow or keep some of my books. Yet I never see them being used. Again, right in front of them. Have we become too lazy? Surely some human had to be open enough to write this data to begin with. So why do ignorant animals exist? Your guess is as good as mine. I love discovering new things. I love reading stories with morals. Norm says I am constantly open to everything around me, I suppose. I'm not particularly aware of it, but Norm says that's what a natural trait is. I don't let the disrespect get to me. And in fact, knowing those kinds of animals exist only makes me more curious. I know that the more I'm being myself, the more open others will be too. So I humbly suggest, if you are old enough, to research and find answers to questions yourselves sometimes. Spreading knowledge around will be much faster that way, as one tiny chipmunk can only do so much. Uh, we'll get back to the topical stuff next time. And, um, uh, look stuff up. I wonder if nerve endings in a chipmunk body are the same as in a red squirrel body. Oh, Mother Nature, I am in agony! Scientific method! Banded! We know so much about the world through the common process codified in the 17th century and developed through the years called the scientific method. Generally, it consists of these steps. 1. When you are curious about something, form a question. Then you propose a hypothesis, a guess that be proven true or false. 3. You make a prediction about the results of a test. Experiment. This is where you take action. Gather the information, the supplies, environment, and conditions needed to determine whether the world behaves like your hypothesis. Analysis. Determine what your results show and what action to take next. Notice how the scientific method does not give you a clear answer to your question. That's because all questions lead to new processes that itself repeats over and over and over again. Because we are all curious to know more about the future. What happens if I pour this unknown substance into this other unknown substance? My no. hypothesis. Let's do another hypothesis. Taking a break from plants, are we? Oh, no, I... This was already dead when I found it. Oh, that doesn't matter. We are all part of the food chain anyway. Sorry? Energy comes and goes through all living things so they can survive. But they all process it through each other. These connections are recorded on a food chain. A chain starts with either sunlight or hot deep sea vents, then goes to plant life, then to animals who eat them, like squirrels and birds, and ends with the apex predator species, like eagles and bears, that have no known enemies. An immense amount of chains all work in relation to one another in a food web. When an animal dies, they are absorbed by detritivores, like earthworms, and decomposers that recycle them into new earth material. Any animals could have several chains branching from underneath them, 
men can also be prey to those who can eat them. Ooh. Yeah, I'm a prey. Whee! Time for a bedtime story. This is about a creature called the Dodo. Oh, those athletic fairy birds that carried knights over medieval mountains? No, these went extinct a few centuries ago and they could not fly. I still have my imagination. They are the most popular extinct animal in modern times, attributed to their somewhat weird appearance, alarmingly swift and mysterious disappearance, and isolated location. The general idea is that they were dim-witted, overweight, and clumsy. Uh, I like turtles. But reports actually say they had quick reflexes and were nowhere near as fat. Their inability to fly, along with there being no predators on the island, meant they didn't run when humans came in the 17th century. Hi. Humans brought over other animals that became their predators, cleared out their forests, and hunted them down for their feathers. It's said that dodos were endangered even before the first recorded sighting of one, as fossils indicate they were victim of a flash flood that preceded it. Aw, oh, that didn't calm me down, did it? Here, have a new storybook. Good night. Thanks. Cory, you have the attention span of a goldfish. This episode is a perfect fit for you. I'm wealthy? The goldfish is a member of the carp family. They were first domesticated in China a thousand years ago. With yellow being the color of the imperial family, people outside the family were only allowed to breed orange ones, which is why most goldfish today are orange. Once kept indoors, mutations occurred that helped them adapt to the new environment like a large and flowery fantail, or extended eyes. Today, goldfish are the most popular pet fish in the world. They can die within days if not treated the proper way, but if so, they should live for five to 10 years as a great pet. You all know me as an esteemed scholar with a wealth of knowledge about all subjects. However, I'm also a chipmunk. Let's roll it. Number five. From the first episode, Matter and Adams, Adams do not look like that. That's an old model called the Rutherford model. It's actually hard to show what they really look like because they're so small, but we do know from modern technology that they look like a tiny cloud. A good way to visualize what's going on inside them is like this, with electrons spinning around the nucleus in orbits of rating around the center of, like planets and suns. This is called the Bohr model. The number of electrons and protons are equal in number on a stable atom. Number four. From the same episode, atoms actually can be split into smaller particles that they're made of, electrons, protons, and neutrons, and even those can be split into smaller particles yet. There is a lot of energy keeping these particles together, so much that nuclear explosions are even created by breaking apart bigger atoms in a very specific way. The idea that atoms being the smallest uncuttable level of everything has been outdated for the past century or so. Number 3 From the seventh episode, I say that pesticides kill bees and help plants grow. Bees are essential to the pollination of many plants that produce the food you eat, and actually, many pesticides also kill plants. These pesticides can stay in the ground for a long time and run off into rivers getting in the water supply, so use pesticides carefully. Number 2 From the second episode, the sugar molecule shown in the episode is actually drawn as a hydrocarbon, which is only made of hydrogen and carbon atoms, while sugars are also made up of oxygen atoms. You can pick a sugar molecule out of a lineup because they almost always made of the same number carbon and oxygen atoms and double the hydrogen atoms, like glue close here. Six atoms of carbon, twelve of hydrogen, and six of oxygen. 
So to simplify in photosynthesis, six carbon dioxide and six water molecules go in, and what comes out is the sugar glucose for the plant and oxygen gas for us. Number one. From the third episode, and this may be the most egregious mistake of all, a meerkat is not a squirrel. All right. Not sure where that misinformation came from, but a meerkat is actually in the same family as a mongoose, like Ricky Tiki Tavi. They look similar! By the way, I wrote the scripts you wanted. Bottom line, everyone makes mistakes, even mentors. The key is to own up to them and learn from them for the future. Thank you for watching, everyone!